everyone for joining us today for uh, the, the next in the Carlos is um, planning policy series of planning policy webinars. Um, today, our subject is next generation planning for net zero regeneration, looking at what's necessary on planning and housing, um, I'm guided, I hope, by the, the recent context of the COP26 conference in Glasgow. Um, so essentially, the, the, the essay question we're setting ourselves in today's dialogue and exchange is really to ask ourselves, how will modern design and reimagined placemaking put sustainability at the heart of regeneration? Um, to answer this question, we have, as ever, a top expert panel to provide views, insights and recent experience, some from Glasgow, um, to help guide our thinking and create a, um, the debate about what's necessary going forward. Um, first up, we ha will have Richard Blythe, Richard's Head of Policy, Practice and Research at the Royal Town Planning Institute. We're also joined with a practitioner, Lorna Taverner, Lead Architect at Collider. We'll also have um, Robin Thorne, Senior Development Manager at Exeter City Living, and Erin Walsh, Director of Built Environment for the Connected Places Catapult. So um, in terms of the format for today, I'm going to invite the speakers to say their, their, their piece. Then we're going to have questions from the panel. Any questions you have, please chuck them in the Q&A box if you can, and um, we will try and answer as many as we can within the allotted hour. Um, for those following on Twitter, we do have a hashtag, if you would be so good, and the hashtag is next zero regen. So very quick now, before I it, it get our, our speakers up and running, the context and background to this is that building sustainability in the era of net zero will, to our minds at heart, be an issue of how much as where we live. Um, but if visioneering is necessary, what future do we wish to create for the society we wish to build our lives into? And in this context, how might planning, design and the politics of placemaking optimise that intrinsic connection between our physical environment and our social lives? So at a practical level, we must address how you know, the move to zero carbon can be realistically achieved by developers with their commercial constraints and supported by the local state planning authorities and all the rest. Um, this means no face facing our everyday solutions, one face a day. And also if we can sort of plan ahead, what will the, the, the challenges, the roadblocks be on the road to net zero over the next decade and beyond? Um, so in terms of talking about this, what role might there be for improved design codes in helping all stakeholders, developers, regulators, central government and councils and communities to navigate a more direct path to a built environment agenda for the end of the decade? And how can we translate this to different parts of the country? What does this um, as a built environment agenda fit for net zero mean for the three Ds here? Design, demand and demography. Um, so we're going to hopefully you know, go through the houses today um, asking, look, how can we use innovation, digital as much as physical means to drive net zero regeneration? Um, what could the potential role of digital planning and improved community engagement to bring higher standards of energy efficiency, as well as design quality, passive house and the rest to new, new builds? as well as repurposing and refurbishing existing buildings. What standards do we think are best followed for meeting specific outcomes? And you know, what would low energy solutions do to smooth the transition? And what might this mean to realistic whole life costs and social benefits? So a lot to be going through today. Um, I'm going to invite our panel in, in alphabetical order more or less. So a great friend of the car list, Richard Blythe, if I can ask you to unmute, introduce yourself and take it away, please. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, well, the first thing I'd like to say is that I'm 
glad, Jonathan, you mentioned um, placemaking because there's a lot of talk about building design, which I'll come on to. But um, from the planning point of view, the first question is, uh, are new buildings well located in relation to promoting active travel and reducing uh, the use of private vehicles? Um, we don't have a particularly good track record in this respect in this country. Um, the RTPI will be publishing next week the third iteration in our location of development work programme. Uh, assessing how well located thousands of planning permissions are in relation to uh, access to amenities by different means, including walking, cycling, public transport, and also the car. Um, it's good also that Lucalis is talking about regeneration because I think um, almost by definition, although it's not a, an absolute guaranteed certainty. Um, if you reuse existing land, you tend to be producing developments which are better located. Um, it's the remote urban fringe locations that are, uh, and the countryside locations that are badly located. If we can reuse land in our conurbations, like, for example, the West Midlands mayor is, is, is spearheading in um, the West Midlands conurbation centred on Birmingham and Wolverhampton, then that almost, by definition, put you in a good position to make the most of existing walking, cycling and public transport assets. And actually what's going on with Andy Street is actually to improve some of those walking, cycling and public transport assets as well. Last year, we did a project on what is the pathway to net zero uh, locally. And I think the first point is one which uh, very much came out also at the COP26 uh, conference where I was to be there on the fringes. And that's really to, 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 to draw attention away from things like our sole uh, faith in electric vehicles to solve our net zero problems. Anyone who's been in a traffic jam at all recently will realize that simply changing the fuel for your car is not going to get you to the destination any more quickly. And um, there's a lot of people don't yet own cars who may well want to. So we need to think about other ways of doing it. And I'm just going to see if I can share a, uh, a thing that's on my screen at the moment. Uh, that, which is the, the template that we use for that next year study, where we said, well, first of all, the question to ask yourself is, do I need to travel at all? Can I do it online? Can I have it delivered? Can I do it locally? Uh, and that's something we've learned a lot about being local in the last 18 months. Then if I can't do it uh, without traveling, can I travel in the most sustainable way? Can I use active travel, can I use public transport? Can I share uh, travel? And I think it's all what, un untapped digital potential around uh, asset sharing and transport. And then finally, um, so if you've exhausted all the other possibilities, can I, um, a vehicle which uses uh, net zero non fossil fuel energy. So that's the kind of basis of our uh, of our net zero transport work. Um, and just another topical point is that the, the government consulted on the national policy statement on energy, and we sent in a response on Monday. Just just to bear in mind the. Uh, the huge implications it will be to quadruple our renewable gen energy generating capacity in the next 30 years. We've been used to a whole energy infrastructure that's based very much on using uh, power stations along big rivers like the Trent and then um, sending all that power a long distance in big power lines. And we're going to really have to get used to a different kind of national grid. Um, which is going to be quite, uh, quite a challenge in terms of getting people used to uh, perhaps new uh, high voltage transmission lines crossing the countryside. We come into buildings themselves, which I'm sure most of this discussion will be about. Um, we're concerned about embodied carbon in buildings. There's a campaign being led by the Institute of Structural Engineers to um, try and get greater awareness both in regulation and policy of 
just how much carbon is used, particularly in creating cement uh, or construction of concrete. Um, one of the aspects of that that's perhaps often been concerned about is the issue of harmonizing VAT rates between uh, rebuilding and repair and new building. It's a, it's a playing field hugely tilted towards demolishing and rebuilding. And then when it comes to uh, the use of the building, so we might the, the in-use um, carbon implications, um, we've heard a lot of talk about heat pumps and district heating. Um, heat pumps do require a collective view of uh, action in the built environment, which is quite difficult to square with perhaps some of the more individualistic attitudes towards my home is my castle. So really, if we can start moving to you know, phasing out gas boilers, some of the best ways of doing that are to treat certainly blocks of flats in their entirety, but also even perhaps clusters of housing. So this idea that you have your own version of everything, uh, your own boiler, that does come into conflict a little bit with some of the best ways of dealing with um, trying to phase out fossil fuels for home heating. And um, it also does pose quite a lot of challenges to you know, how you would build a new block of flats and certainly huge challenges to retrofitting. And just finally, um, just to, to, to kind of bear in mind um, that the planning system is not concerned with existing buildings unless the use changes. So the big elephant in the room of all of this is the 99% of the housing stock that doesn't get constructed every year, but is already there. And one of the things that has concerned us a little bit is the uh, government being very enthusiastic about giving the owners of buildings the opportunity to reuse them, like turning uh, offices into houses or flats. And actually, we've, we've wasted an opportunity, I think, as part of that process to say, well, you can do that, but you really must uh, retrofit at the same time. You can't just get people sleeping in sleeping bags, basically, on. On, on the floors of offices, which um, if you've ever watched any of those rom-coms about <laughs> people sleeping over in the office, you realise yeah, offices are not a great place to stay. And some of the most deprived families have actually been shoehorned into these converted offices, which is terrible. I've overrun a little, but thank you. Many thanks indeed, Richard, for getting us off to such a good start. Can I next ask Lorna Taverner to unmute and present, please? Over to you, Lorna. Hi everyone, I'm Lorna Taverner. I'm a lead architect at Collider and my background is in residential design. What I, when I moved to Collider about 14 months ago now, what we were really challenged and handed down from Wilmot Dixon, who are our parent body, a main contractor, as everyone knows, was the challenges of, you know, what does everybody have to do by 2030, by 2050 with all the net zero carbon rules? And what can we be doing now to make sure that we're going to achieve them, but achieve them with real integrity? So it's not only, you know, can we achieve that net zero carbon, but what is the difference of doing that now in your new build homes or having to retrofit it? Everyone's also aware of that performance gap of about 40% when, when we did research of this might be what is predicted to happen, but what does, what does the building actually perform as? And as you mentioned in one of the questions, Jonathan, we've actually decided to go down the route of using Passive House to close that performance gap. But really what we've tried to do whilst making that sustainability inherent to everything that we're doing, making sure you know, we're going above and beyond in achieving net zero carbon, Passive House and Passive House Plus actually, um, it's really to ensure that you can have your cake and eat it. You know, we don't have to, sideline sustainability as as one element and then place making or good homes and good design as a secondary or tertiary we really can do it all together so it doesn't have to be you know your engineers sitting one side doing the calculations and then later on you just plonk them on a site and you don't think about the homes the community and and all of that inherent you know what where people want to live because as much as we can say and we can push the sustainability, if it's not desirable and if people don't really resonate with what it is or understand even that education piece about what it means for the future, 
I don't think we can really actually push forward and, and get people to be on board in those goals, whether it is in your new builds or in your retrofitting. You know, if someone's boiler was to break down and they don't really understand the, the pros of potentially putting in an air source heat pump, why would they do that? And we really need to be vocal about making sure people do understand and want to be on the journey with us. So it's short and sweet from me. That's very sweet and no, very concise, Lorna. Very th many thanks for getting that across so well. And I'm next going to invite Exeter's very own Robin Thorne. Um, Senior Development Manager for Exeter City Living to you know to give a you know, concrete example. Please over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, thank you all as well for um, taking the time this morning to to, to meet up. Um, my name is Robin Thorne. I'm a chart surveyor, a development surveyor, a senior development manager actually at Exeter City Living. Um, Exeter City Living is the development company um, created by Exeter City Council. Um, Exeter's journey, or Exeter, of, of course, uh, called a climate emergency. Um, they specialise in delivering certified passive house um, homes. Uh, they started their journey 14 years ago with the first, with the second, I think, certified passive house home in the country in 2009. Um, they followed that up by the first um, uh, pa passive house multi residential scheme in 2010. Um, recently, they've delivered 53 um, passive house extra care um, homes um, and are due to finish the UK's first uh, leisure centre and um, swimming pool complex um, certified passive house early in the new year. So they've delivered around 200 certified passive house homes. Their journey started pu purely in response to fuel poverty. And I think that's quite important now, bearing in mind the government's decarbonisation of the grid and the proposals for the future home standard. Because we've all seen on the news in terms of people's gas bills rocketing and electricity costs going up. So actually, this kind of hiccup at the moment has brought things a bit closer. So we've been predicting for a number of years, within the next five to 10 years, that energy costs will double in this country. If we continue on this tra trajectory in terms of future home standard, yes, it's a step in the right direction, but th the air tightness and things like that are still going to be such that you've got a force five blown outside, you, the entire volume of your house will be disappearing more than twice during an hour. So the energy costs and the strategy at the moment, there's a misalignment. Now, Richard had pointed out that how can we generate four times the amount of electricity? Um, supply and demand, prices will go up. Um, so that's something, the, the reason, the justification why we've continued with certified passive house, um, not to mention, once people move in these new homes, they don't want to move out. They're very satisfied. Um, another approach, and it's a risk that passive house brings, is your increasing air tightness. We try to avoid any petrochemicals in the development of our homes. In response to that, we use a German standard called um, building biology in terms of S SBM 2015. Now that at its core is a risk management tool in terms of creating healthier environments for people, particularly air pollution. There, there are plenty of studies in this country. We lead the world, unfortunately, when it comes to asthma. Um, so what Passive House does, because of the MVHR and the filtration, is provides very healthy homes. Not to mention it's a comfort standard in terms of in terms of surface temperature. So those are two of the sort of core standards that we've responded to and moving forward. So everything we do will be. Passive House Plus moving forward. What we've done today has been certified Passive House. Um, in terms of placemaking, um, historically uh, we, we adopted permaculture principles, but now there's a new, relatively new standard in terms of building with nature. So we look to integrate quality 
green infrastructure in terms of in terms of the placemaking agenda, giving space for biodiversity, for wildlife, for nature. And we we found there's lots of studies out there in terms of the benefits that bring to people in terms of being in that um, that that green environment. Um, I mean, Richard mentioned about sort of electric vehicles and I must confess in terms of the government's um, statement recently, recently about all new homes sh shall have electric vehicle charging points. That kind of puts the motor vehicle front and central and dominates the placemaking and the built environment. So that's something that's been going on for about the last 80 years in this country. Um, I don't know whether, whether any of you know Exeter, but um, it's a great city, but it does have congestion. It does have traffic congestion issues. So all of our schemes moving forward, um, we're in a transitional period, but the, the aspiration is to go with zero vehicles in terms of in terms of no car parking spaces we're not there and we're not going to be there for some time so we make sure in every scheme we use um, electric vehicle hubs so that means cars um, light vans um, cycles cargo bikes so all these are provided to demonstrate we don't need every home to have access to car parking because there are alternative active measures exit of, of have developed um, a series of policy documents in terms of the exit of vision, in terms of building up, regeneration of existing brownfield sites, in terms of they tend to be more sustainable because somebody's already put the infrastructure all around as opposed to on the periphery. Um, so we've got, we've got the ex documents like the exit of vision, we've got active exeter. So we're actually incorporating um, alternative means of transport. With the EV hubs, um, there's work going on in terms of integrating um, trains, buses, as well as EVs and, and cycles um, that you can access them via an app. Um, we've seen already there's a transition in terms of the number of people actually getting car licenses are reducing with time. So we're very keen in terms of creating more healthier environments healthy homes in terms of building biology, the interiors, as well as um, great placemaking, incorporating building with nature. So that's kind of me summed up in, in terms of our experiences. We've, we've, we've developed, as I say, nearly 200 certified passive house homes, and we've got a pipeline of 1,300 um, new homes. Um, they're virtually all on really difficult sites. I would say that, wouldn't I? In terms of brownfield, contaminated, flood risk issues, um, technically, technically quite a challenge, but, but very often you can come up with very simple solutions um, that don't cost the earth. Thank you very much. Robin, many thanks indeed. And you, you've got a, a small presentation about exiting living. I can share that with colleagues, many people who've registered and are going to thank you e email if that's okay by you, Robin. By all means, absolutely fine. Lovely. Well, look, our final panellist, Erin um, Walsh from Connected Places Catapult. Erin, congratulations for having the Christmas tree up. Oh yeah, absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't come on this morning without it done, Jonathan. Um, yeah, thank you very much and uh, good morning all and uh, thank you for joining the, the discussion this morning. So as Jonathan mentioned, I'm Erin Walsh, I'm Director of Built Environment at Connected Places Catapult. So for those on the call who may not know us, we're one of nine catapults across the UK and uh, we're an accelerator, the UK's uh, accelerator for cities, transport and uh, mobility. So this discussion is a great one to be part of this morning. So I wanted to come in on Jonathan, how you framed the dis discussion at the beginning and you talked about net zero uh, and the three Ds. So design, demand and demography. And I think we've heard that from our colleagues on the call this morning. And I'm just gonna share some of my thoughts on it. So starting with, design and I'm going to zoom out to a, a macro level and I think Robin has just touched on it there as has Richard also and I think you know we talk about net zero planning or we talk about net zero built environment but you know our planning system and our built environment are completely interdependent 
with our energy system and with our transport system. And, you know, there are three quite substantial systems in our journey to net zero, and yet we treat them quite individual. Even the sectors align to them individually, our governance aligns to them, and even at a local government level. And I think we need to break that down. And I think we need to start working across those horizontally to move forward together for net zero in place making. Um, and I think it's a systems-based approach. And I think we now more than ever are enabled to do that. And I think this is where innovation and digitization uh, really uh, supports us. So creating that kind of digital architecture, um, we have that ability now to do that. We've been working on some of this work with the likes of Glasgow City Council and their Sustainable Glasgow Board, and uh, we were partnered with Energy Systems Catapult. And it was great to see so many stakeholders across the city and the region coming together, across those three systems, transport, planning, and also energy, to talk about how they could work together and how they could be uh, some other parts. And what was quite interesting from some of our research was, you know, we, we looked at 97 different documents across the region that talked about net zero across those three sectors, but there was not one unified plan of how they would get there together. Glasgow is not alone. That is across the entire UK. We need to look at our ways of working and how we start to tackle this together. So that's kind of my, my key one on the, on the design side. It's that design thinking. So even our approach to it, I think we need to look at. At Connected Places Catapult, we're doing research on this. We have a project at the moment, Integrated Place Planning, and we're uh, working with thought leaders and stakeholders um, in these spaces to understand how could we work together? What would that digital infrastructure look like? What would the ways of working be? So if anyone's on the call is interested in it, I'm very happy um, to discuss it more. We'll have some of our findings out early in the new year as well. And really, our purpose about that is to stimulate thinking and look at kind of new ways of working. So coming to the second D uh, is the demand. And Lorna mentioned this, and I think you're absolutely right, Lorna. This is about kind of bringing um, people with us and also around that desirability point. And I think this is particularly important because we're seeing a lot. Um, actually, I'm going to go back to another point. Richard made quite nicely as well, was that 80% of the homes that we'll have in 2050 are already built. So there's a huge adaptation agenda here. And if I use another number, 60% of all the homes in the UK are owner occupied. So a lot of the work we're seeing at the moment, you know, brilliantly so, is our registered social landlords. It's also the private um, uh, house owners. Um, but that 60% is substantial and we really need to work with homeowners uh, on the demand side. And I think this is really important because I think we need to get better. And when I say we, there's a lot of us in that we, from central government, local governments, and also uh, thought leaders in that space. And we need to get better at communicating, clarifying, and providing confidence to homeowners and end users. Because I can't imagine what this must feel like. You know, they're hearing what the stats are, they're hearing about climate change, but I don't think we're empowering them to make changes. Um, and I think we really need to, to up our game in how we do that. And I think um, I'll reflect back on uh, the Localis report uh, in October of this year that you very kindly uh, invited me to join actually one of the workshops on that. Um, a piece of work that we did as well about two years ago on uh, the road to retrofit. And I've seen it come up again and again across other thought leaders in the industry. And it's the premise about one-stop shops within communities on um, retrofitting of the home, adaptation and mitigation, and looking at how can communities and homeowners be part of this journey towards net zero. And again, I'd like to wave a flag for that because I think that's something very tangible and something that could be rolled out. So on the demand side, on that education, on the communication and confidence building, I think there are uh, opportunities there with that one-stop shop concept as well. Um, the third D is demography. And I think this one is really interesting and presents an opportunity to us. As we race to our net zero in 2030 for some uh, local authorities, and we also look at 2050 as our statutory obligation, if we take those two dates and we look at it across our, our demographics and our shifts, by 2030, 20% uh, of the UK population will be over 65. So we're seeing that shift for the first time ever. By 2050, 
that will increase to 25%. That's a quarter of the UK population will be over the age of 65 by 2050. And if we couple that with our homes right now, and we think about kind of adaptation and mitigation, we know that our poor quality housing actually contributes 1.4 billion pounds of um, access uh, treatment for the NHS. That's the BRE's finding. Uh, we know within that the highest contributor is actually cold homes, right? And that's up in the region of about 850 million cold homes is costing the NHS a year. And um, on it as well is damp homes as well at approximately 38 million. So the need to get to net zero is absolutely about climate change, but it's a little bit like that kind of systems thinking approach. It's not just about the only winner is not kind of the climate. There are many others in this if we take a very open approach to how we do it. So I think on the demography, what I wanted to say there was I see it as an opportunity to approach this around net zero and also supporting healthy aging in the home and ensuring our homes are fit for the future. So they're just three uh, areas or um, my thoughts on three of the areas for the discussion this morning. Thanks, Jonathan. Many thanks. Um, many thanks to Erin for taking us through, through the three Ds and huge thanks too to Lorna, Richard and Robin for you know, setting out the stall on policy, the, practic the practical sides of this agenda. So now we've reached the halfway point. We're going to throw um, open to questions. If you can put your, what you have to say in the Q&A box, so much the better, we, we can address it um, and, and get going. But uh, I'll to, to start off with to the panel. Clearly, um, I think, thanks, thanks, thanks for citing our, our, our retrofit, recent retrofitting report, Erin. Um, the original was at our kind of the round table launch last week, the cars had a report about, about flooding. And really they're kind of both instances, retrofitting and flooding, really kind of the, 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 the national top-down pressures for housing targets are meeting kind of the road of climate change or transition to different forms of energy, different forms of living. And you know, you, you're seeing you know, perverse consequences um, why are people building in floodplains? Well, we did, did, did the work. Um, th th there's your answer. Ditto you know, the retrofitting challenge. You know, how is this going to work in parts of the country where you know, the value of properties is um, you know, around a quarter of the entire cost of, 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 of the process? Now, it's very, very keen to um, pick up the points raised by I think everyone about kind of brownfield land. Clearly, we're waiting for the in terms of the big political item, the housing and planning bill to make its make its appearance. As with so much of this government, it's kind of um, it, it's it, these 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 things are nailed to the wall with jelly, aren't they? You know, the levelling up white paper is it going to be um, uh, uh, out there before Christmas or is it going to be um, in the new year New Year sale? Honestly. Nobody knows, but when it, when it comes, then um, but, but clearly, you know, for, for, for Michael Gove as the Secretary of State for DLUC, it makes the entire political sense to shift the burden away from um, greenfield sites and more prosperous parts of the south, the east, and uh, to the, the home counties um, to get the algorithms working in that pers in, in, in that perspective. Um, are there any more issues around sort of you no? Know, better use of brownfield or more um, or, or speeding up um, development of brownfield sites where um, industry, local government or maybe regulations could be changed to make things um, happen at, at a quicker pace, um, at a better pace and in line with everything we've now got from you know, better home standards, um, the net zero um, edicts as well as what was handed down from COP26. Any sort of further thoughts about better brownfield for net zero regeneration, anyone from the panelists? From, from, from a local authority perspective, I mean, the government do have um, initiatives in terms of uh, brownfield land release fund. Um, that was a scheme uh, earlier in the year in terms of incentivizing um, I might use the phrase gap um, funding in, in terms of bringing forward those more difficult brownfield sites um, with a particular emphasis towards um, low or zero 
zero carbon homes. So, so, so there are some initiatives out there. I know Exeter have taken advantage of that scheme in particular. Um, in, 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 terms of, in terms of flood risk and building floodplains, yeah, so many of our cities are built on, on large river systems. Um, and there are, there are technical solutions that there in terms of um, almost going back and, and re-engineering those, those uh, flood defences of the sort of 60s and 70s um, with a more natural approach. So compensatory flood um, storage in terms of to enable sensible development, um, but actually improving the status quo for the wider community. Um, and the Environment Agency are kind of open to, um, to, to sensible suggestions in terms of providing the appropriately modelled. Um, so yeah, I, I think there are still some advantages um, in, in terms of brownfield regeneration, something we're looking at as well as building up. Um, so trying to utilise the airspace above existing low-rise apartment buildings, um, creating that, taking that value as it were, and using that to sort of kickstart uh, wrapping buildings um, to bring them to a sensible energy um, demand. Uh, in Exeter, they've used um, Energy Sprung as a, um, as a, as a pilot scheme. Um, we've looked at uh, Enifit as well. Um, that tends to be very expensive because you're applying Passive House to something which didn't respect building physics, uh, geometry, um, passive energy. But a more practical, a pragmatic approach may be um, what used to be the AECB silver standard in, in terms of you're still improving that existing stock substantially um, on an individual basis. Uh, in, in, in city environments, I think Exeter have got 538 uh, apartment buildings. Um, that, that's the city council's housing stock. So there's, there's massive opportunities there to actually regenerate, to use the value created to offset the cost of the wider um, carbon reduction strategy. Many thanks, Robin. Anyone else from the panelists? Lorna. Yeah, I, it was more picking up on what Robin said, really. And, you know, I know there is a lot of um, concerns about building in the flood risk. But what we've got to think about, as Richard rightly mentioned, is if the infrastructure is already there and it is a brownfield site, you know, as long as you can do reasonable mitigation that doesn't make it non-viable for the customer, um, then it is something that we've got to consider because it, that is better than going you know, much further out and having a greenfield site with no infrastructure there at all. So it's, it's, it's risky, but it's something we need to be open to. Many thanks, Lorna. Erin, you've got your hand up, please come in. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. So just kind of um, uh, one comment on this as well. And I think this, again, is where um, innovation and digitization is actually helping, particularly on the brownfield uh, site question. So uh, the new data standard set up by the digital planning team at DULAC um, in 2020 looked at brownfield land registers. So for all local authorities to publish their data on their brownfield sites. So they've created a standard for every local authority to do that. And that's tremendously helpful because you start to be able to then see the brownfield sites at a local level, but also to scale that up at a, a national level as well. Um, and I just mentioned that because I think that's an example of where, you know, data and digitization becomes an enabler for, for um, evidence-based decision making in net zero. So I just thought that was a, a point worth mentioning in, in this context as well. Many thanks, Ed. Rich, any, any thoughts your side on what? Well, um, the brownfield greenfield argument has been going on for hmm. all my life, <laughs> all my professional life. Um, I was very struck by something that um, Oliver Letwin wrote in his uh, build out report, the previous prime minister, which is looking at why it is that there are so many planning commissions that aren't built on. Actually, he came to the conclusion of saying it's the right one. Actually, there aren't that many planning commissions that aren't built on. But one of the problems is possibly that the large sites take a long time. 
and he said that there's no there's no there's no free lunch on this. You know, if you look at the Netherlands, when planning permission is granted, they then assemble a team of 25 professionals in the public sector to work with the, the developers to make that development work. What do we do? We give maybe two hours attention to a uh, application when it's permitted, we're hoping that it will be completed according to the uh, permitted plans, but we don't in the public sector drive forward delivery on those sites, making sure that the house is completed according to a proper programme, ensuring that the infrastructure is provided from the disparate infrastructure providers. There's just a whole difference in the public sector taking a lead in um, some of the comparative countries, whereas we seem to think that it's going to be enough for the housing developers to take the lead, and you know, quite often it isn't. And I think uh, one of the, you know, the challenges of the brownfield sites is um, to make sure that, that, that uh, bringing together all the right expertise, expertise happens, and, and it, it isn't cheap, um, which is the reason why we have this, this rebalancing fund to make sure that you know, you're going as far as you can to this level playing field as against the greenfield competition. Many thanks, Richard. Um, we have a um, here we've got a question from Anne from Bridge North Sh Shropshire. Um, she she poses the question: Does re more retirement accommodation, I flats, um, is that an acceptable solution to the demography? Now, Erin, very very grateful indeed for know what you had to say on on the final of the D's. Um, and with all this, that we we are now faced with uh, not not only an incre you know, increasing population for a time, but an increasingly elderly you know, population, um, how we care for each other, how we keep the whole you know, social care, that's an argument for another day, but how we live, the types of accommodation we're living in to promote dignity in life, well-being, um, keep, you know, reducing the risk of accidents or injuries that put further upstream pressure on our beleaguered health services, um, and all, all the rest of it. Um, and also in the context of, of energy usage too, now you, you used to work for uh, anti-poverty charities in the past, and you'd run kind of your kind of heat or eat campaigns. Um, clearly we're going through an energy bottleneck at the moment, and that would become a, a greater story over Christmas and the new year as those monthly quarterly bills hit in. Um, any sort of further thoughts or elaboration about how we can you know, make best use of design, technology, placemaking to, um, to, know, to, to, know, to accommodate, to provide the homes our growing and increasingly elderly population will need over the future. With all else that's going on in terms of changes in you know, energy usage, um, transportation, and also the, the Robin, you sort of know much your emphasis about city living. You no, know, the use of you no know, high streets and town centres, as of course they need to evolve and adapt, as has been kind of a you no know, universally raised since the start of the pandemic. How can we build better for and more um, sustainably for an increasing and elderly demographic? Any any thought anyone to pick that up? Erin, you, you I, first. I'm happy to start, and I think I can see Robin's going to come in on this as well. So just first and foremost, Anne, thank you so much for your question in the chat there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know Bridge North uh, very well. Uh, beautiful place. So, um, so I think um, the point I was making was about if we have this, and I would, you know, it depends which way you look at it. We can call it a challenge or we can call it an opportunity and I'm definitely on the latter because um, I think if we bring together our thinking and net zero we're going to need to work on our homes and we're going to have to retrofit them or modernize them or make them fit for the future and why not take that opportunity as well to ensure that our homes are fit for the future for net zero and also for our well-being and I use the um, some of those numbers around our, our aging population I use 65 there and um, I see that as immensely positive and that's testament to innovation in, in our medical care system and our well-being uh, and many other systems along with that. So I see that only as an opportunity. Um, 
those numbers from the NHS, that 1.4 uh, billion, I don't have the breakdown of the, the uh, demo demographics behind that, but cold and damp homes are not something that only affect our over 65 population. They affect everybody, right from early childhood, from infancy, right through. So this is about quality of life in our homes. And I think that is kind of, that's a non-negotiable. Um, and we need to take this opportunity as we approach net zero to uh, also ensure our homes are fit for the future for our residents. The point about the retirement, and I appreciate Anne, I don't know the full context there at all, um, but that's quite interesting. And I think that's something to be welcomed and we need to welcome more uh, retirement or, or uh, yeah, retirement homes in the UK. We only have 1% of our housing stock in the UK is uh, retirement homes. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for us to look at that. And I think I'd pick up on what Robin had said as well. I think there's an opportunity to do that in our town centers, in our cities. Uh, it's great to hear Bridge North are doing that. I know uh, other city centers like Chester City have been looking to do that specifically. Um, so I think it's about taking a joined up approach. And I, I don't think that is difficult actually. I don't think it's difficult for us to be joined up because um, it makes a lot of sense to bring our demographics and also our net zero opportunity together as we plan going forward. So I don't think I've fully answered that question, but I know other colleagues on the call will have some thoughts as well. Thank you, Erin, for that call for a bit of joint upness. Robin, quickly, what, 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 what do you uh, take? So, so, sorry, for, for, from the extra experience, I mean, they've just, they've just finished 53 extra care passive house um, homes. Um, I, statistically, 60% of people who live in the new build passive house homes in Exeter have never had to turn the heating on. So in terms of, you know, eradicating fuel poverty, um, cold, wet, damp homes and the rest of it, um, it kind of speaks volumes. You know, 60% never had to turn the space heating on. Yes, we still need hot water heating. Um, I, I think fundamentally the principle of creating homes for 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 uh, retirement living um, is appropriate. We've talked about the the increased number, the proportion in the community, and quite se sensibly, if there are these bespoke homes, as it were, smaller homes, that's going to free up surely other accommodation for for uh, in in the built environment. So. In terms of use of resources, I think it makes perfect sense. Um, sharing experiences. Recently, we've we've um, showcased um, the extra care to some other local authorities in in terms of where they are seeking um, to develop similar schemes, and they've been taken back at the environments within these within these homes. Um, virtues of passive house. 19 degrees Celsius in a passive house home because you haven't got those drafts, because you haven't got those code surfaces creating drafts, it's a comfortable environment, is the equivalent of 21 degrees Celsius in a normal home because you're actually controlling the moisture content in those spaces. So there is a benefit in terms of creating appropriate um new build accommodation for, for, for the retired and elderly, the less mobile, I should suggest. Many thanks, Rob. We've got a good question about community engagement. Well, this is an opportunity to Lorna and Richard to have their tuppenny worth. I'm um, starting with you, Lorna, quickly. Thank you. Yeah, so it's the question from Jim Dean that we're looking at. Yeah, um, so let's, let's go to the question. So, so Jim Dean said that as a councillor, the challenges of meeting the 2030, 2050 targets seem daunting. I would like to start by drawing in the community to support changes that we can start to implement. Are there any models, Jim asks, of how the community involvement can really work at a cross authority level or at a local neighbourhood level? So the interest there is clearly um, at the, the, the party conference has just gone, um, uh, sort of Danny Kruger, who's now Michael Gove's, um, who's for the, the, the conservative you know, advocate champion of community, communitarianism, when they were um, saying, let's have those hands up street votes for planning changes. And certain councillors of our, our Ken were quite horrified at what that would mean in, for them as, as, as local, local members. But no, clearly Michael Gove 
It's very cha- he was championing it in Parliament, and they were going to have street votes so people can put extensions up. But how will this you know, kind of idea of local consent um, translate to what we're trying to achieve here, which is um, clean growth, sustainable living, he- um, for health and well-being? What, what, what do you see is important here, Lorna? I mean, directly to the question, I don't necessarily have any examples of um, cross authority level um, engagement. But in my experience of the planning process and trying to you know, uh, force things down local neighborhoods, it's mm-hmm. never going to be perceived well. And that will really impact how people interact with things. So before you even start, you can really have a negative connotation even if you've actually done something incredibly successful. Take, for example, as Robin said, um, Exeter moving towards car-free schemes. In London, that was handed down in the London plan. And each time that I've had a a planning consultation or I've gone to um, planning boards, the main objection has been, "There's there's no parking, what's that going to do to our streets already? Yes, we like all of the increased greenery, the landscaping and the community environment that that brings, but we also want the parking. And I really believe that if we actually take people with us on that journey, explaining the mitigation we'll do so with the hubs of the communal cars, etc., how that will be dotted around in that landscape for everyone, I think they can start to get their head around it and we can actually work towards the goal. Um, So long-winded answer, I'm afraid there, but I think whilst I don't have any particular examples, it would really be worthwhile doing that community engagement piece because if you're feeling daunted, so are all the people that live in those communities. Many thanks, Lorna. Richard, do you want to come in and ask though, how can you bring the local community with you in all this? There's been a lot of talk about street votes, uh, which is quite an interesting idea. Um, There again, there will likely be development. It occurs to me that it would be a good opportunity to say, well, if you do want to put an extra one or two stories on your house, you know, the deal is that you do have to do, you do have to retrofit your house at the same time. And that would require a tweak to the proposal. I'm not sure that's in the think tank proposals at the moment from the policy exchange or in the uh, private members bill, but I'd have to check. And it seems to me that, you know, if you're getting all this extra value, which is supposed to be the incentive, you know, your house will go up in value by a half because it's taller, um, then surely, you know, you can give something back to the climate by saying, well, you know, the disruption of building an extra story to on a house is so big that that would be an awful great opportunity to say, well, you know, now you must uh, improve your uh, retrofitting, do your retrofitting now. And in this house, um, when we did, uh, we did a sort of deal where we doubled the insulation in the roof in order to get within the insulation envelope more uh, space ground on, on the ground floor. So it's, it's, it seems quite reasonable if you're going to use something as, as, as disruptive as building an extra store on your house, you ought to be doing some of the other stuff too. Many thanks, Richard. Um, Robin or Erin, any thoughts your side about bringing on uh, the communities to um, they support Robin? You, you've unmuted. I'll put you on yeah. the spot. Yeah, I mean, I, I am aware of, of some local authorities in, it, it, almost acting like uh, a, a mortgage provider in terms of people who want to do up their properties and speaking with um, some of their, their officers, um, they've actually found it to be a good return. And I'm just, I, I've, I've sort of toyed with the idea of what about creating a fund collectively with other neighboring authorities to actually um, subsidize retrofit costs or not subsidize them but actually almost a loan facility um, if you know people have got the will and there are people with the will to to retrofit their properties um, then 
another source of funding. Now, is, is that something local authorities should be doing or is that something the private sector or the government should be doing? Don't know. But in terms of the borrowing uh, capability of organisations to improve the built environment, um, I think it's worth looking at. Um, there will be polluters out there as well in terms of um, they'll continue to pollute and not that not I'm getting to carbon offsetting, but there could be a way of eking out value to actually then put back into local communities for people who wanted to improve, um, do their bit as it were for the, for their home. Many thanks, Robin. And finally, sort of Erin, I put it to you. Um, in terms of community involvement, are there any, any sort of examples you've seen of this working well or potentially working well? And what might be more innovative digital means of securing that 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 genuine consent? Yeah. So I think um, two things I would I would just kind of highlight. So one is, um, you know, I, I think it's kind of thinking out that the with the community at you know, is it at the, and I suppose it'll be at different levels, it'll be the home level, but also the, the neighborhood level. And I'm thinking about the 15 minute neighborhood concept. And I think that provides a very helpful framework. So the 15 minute neighborhood concept is about uh, residents within a neighborhood being able to access their needs, their daily needs within a 15 minute active travel commute. So predominantly walking in this instance, further than that for, for cycling would be outside the 15 neighborhood, 15 minute neighborhood. But it helps give a provider lens. And I know we were working with Hounslow Borough Council where we did a mapping exercise with the community. So it was taking uh, different uh, neighborhoods within Hounslow and working with residents to map actually what are the assets they have within 15 minutes. And those assets were from education to retail to service support to green spaces. And then with that, starting to map, well, what are the routes around this? What does that look like as an environment? Does it, does it enable, does it encourage people to, um, to decide not to use their car, but to take more active travel? Um, and that's been very helpful for Hounslow to understand that data and those insights from, um, from their community. So in terms of the data, we've created a series of maps to look at this so they can see it specifically and can, they can also start to identify where their gaps are. And that helps them with their planning, their forward planning. It also helps them with their licensing. So it gives them a lot of information to make more informed decisions and also to think about where any potential schemes, regeneration or improvement to green spaces and some parks can go. And that has been done in tandem with um, uh, community members. In terms of kind of the over, I'm happy to drop a couple of things if I have time into the chat, but the concept uh, is born out of Paris. We've seen Paris adopted, Melbourne has adopted, Barcelona already kind of had it, but they've even gone back to refine it. So that's the 15 minute neighborhood concept. The other one I'll mention very quickly is uh, retrofit work. So that's at the home level. It's a cooperative approach, working with local authorities, homeowners and uh, industry leaders to bring them together in a much more collaborative approach of how individuals can get to net zero. That's retrofit works. And I think that's worth having a look at also. Many, many thanks indeed, Erin, and many thanks everyone. Um, by the call, a wrap pretty much come up to 12 noon. Um, gratitude should always be the attitude. So huge thanks, first of all, to, to Wilmot Dixon for sponsoring um, th this event, part of our series we've run with them. Huge thanks, Rob. Great expert panelists. Well, I think we learned so much. And thanks for all those stimulating debates and setting out you know, the, the policy, the practice, um, the, the future of this. Huge thanks to Richard, Lorna, Robin, and Erin for you know, for taking us through. You know, I know, I know some great thoughts on where you know, next generation planning can take us through um, to net zero regeneration. Erin, I will buy you some time to drop whatever else you want to put in the chat box. Um, we will wrap this up and put it on YouTube for um, people, folk to watch on Catch Up. Um, huge thanks to everyone who, who, who joined us today for the debate. Any further questions or thoughts or considerations, you know where to find us. Otherwise, it's pinch punch first of the month in the final month of the year. Um, if it's not too early, wishing everyone a very merry and joyful Christmas season coming up. Take wonderful care. 
and hopefully see you in the none too distant future. Thank you, everyone. Take great care.